I've had a problem understanding why as a child we would have a particular dream. And then as we, as we grow up, we become another thing entirely. I've had a problem actually trying to understand why we do that as, as humans, you know. For example, a lion is always going to be a carnivore. A lion is always going to dream of, you know, catching antelopes and eating antelopes. And as the lion grows up, he learns to catch antelopes and eat antelopes. And the lion will continue to do that till he dies. But I think humans are the only species that, you know, as they are young, they dream to become a certain thing. And as they grow older, they deviate completely and begin to do another thing. Someone who is a writer um, could decide to go and read accounting. Or someone who, uh, maybe like, uh, you know, our, our sister that just decided um, a poem for us too. After I graduated in 2017, I went on to work at, um, at National Hospital and other hospitals for like four years after graduating. And I studied radiography and I worked as a radiographer. And this is despite the fact that in secondary school, my counselor had told me that my talents are in engineering. I should become an engineer. But I decided to become a doctor or a radiographer. Why I did that, I still don't know. But maybe it's peer pressure, or maybe it's our parents who, 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 who put that pressure on us. Or maybe it's because of the movies we watch. You know? But it's, I still don't understand that disparity and why we have that disparity in our species, you know, as, um, as humans. So, um, I also realized that, you know, if you veer from your purpose, your life's purpose, and you abandon your talents, and, and, you, and you embrace other things that you don't have talents for, karma is very good at coming back at you and reminding you that this is not your life's purpose. And karma has no voice, so what does it do? It gives you signs and signals. It could be in the form of poverty or hardship or um, addiction, addiction to drugs. In my own case, it was depression. I was depressed. At the age of 21, I was earning six, I was earning six figures already. I was okay. You know, I didn't have a family to take care of, so I was good. I had a loving family. I had, um, I had loving friends. I had a good job, but I was depressed. I didn't know why I was depressed. And I was depressed for quite a long time. And I didn't know why. I didn't enjoy my job. I didn't like it. And I think it was during my moments of depression, I got to understand and I got to realize that your profession, your job, and your passion are different things entirely. And if your profession and your job are not your passion, you are going to struggle. And I struggled. I paid heavily, severely for it. I was, I, was, I was stressed and I was depressed. I suffered. But if you are lucky, even if, your passion, even if your profession and your job are not your passion, they may lead you to your passion. And in my case, uh, you know, that was what happened in my own case. I worked as a radiographer and um, I had some fine slides, you know, to show you the kind of machines I worked with. The kind of machines you can only see in Hollywood movies. Very fine machines, very beautiful machines. And these machines had a, a pack of software, so many software, you know, that you can use to um, interact with the machine. So you can stay very far away from the machines, you know, like 10 meters or 20 meters, and still control the machines and manipulate the machines, you know, and move the machines. And I always found that intriguing. How am I able to? To, to move a thousand kilos of steel and copper and aluminum, you know, by tapping a button or two over here. So I was always, I was always intrigued by that. And one day, I was scanning a patient, and in the middle of my scan, my machine broke down. It was frustrating, you know, because that was the only thing I enjoyed about my work, the machines and the software. So when our machine broke down, we had to ask our patients to leave. When I came back the following day, my boss told me that one of the engineers were using a GE machine then, so 
he told me that one of the engineers wanted to speak with me. I said, okay. I called him. When I called him, he introduced himself, and then he said he was going to walk me through how to, how to run error diagnostics on the machine and possibly fix it. I, I, thought, I thought it was crazy because you can't possibly fix a machine if you are not there with it. You know, that was my mindset. But lo and behold, we logged into a server on the machine, and then he logged into the same server from wherever he was, and he walked me through the process of fixing this machine. And after about uh, an hour or so, our machine was back on. I was mesmerized. I was, I was carried away by the power of software. You know, and something happened that day. I think that's changed my life forever. I decided to become an engineer, a software engineer. So when I got home that day, I made my research. And by research, I mean I used I Googled, I, I used Google, that's research. Um, I Googled, I, 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 I Googled how can I get into tech? And what should I do in tech? What do I need to know in tech? And after about an hour or so of Googling, I decided I'll become a web developer, I'll, I'll create websites. So I'm a, I'm a big fan of itemization, right? I, I like to, uh, to write things down. So I went into my notes app. I took my phone, I went into the notes app, and then I, I started to detail, you know, like what and what I needed if you want to become a software, a, a software engineer, a web developer. So I itemized all of those things, and then I divided, I categorized them into months from January up until December. What am I going to do in January, in February, in March, in April, up until December? So I had my life for that year figured out already. I itemized all of the requirements. And then I started in January. I made this to-do list in December of 2019. And I started in January of 2020. Yes, a lot of the things I said I was going to do, I wasn't able to do. You know, because according to my list, I should be a CEO by now. Uh, but I'm not a CEO. <laughs> but I was able to become a software engineer. Now, here's the takeaway from that. The takeaway from that was, while I was making my to-do list, I thought I, was, I thought I was trying to become a software engineer, but what I was actually doing in essence, inadvertently, was I was, I was realizing and discovering my life's purpose. And fast forward three years later, or well, two years later, you know, because I started in 2020. I have now, I have now gone on to work, you know, with two American companies, and I currently work in one. And every time, every single time, even while seated here, as one of the speakers, I always remember 2019. You know, just three years ago, I was depressed. I was in a dark room, a very small room in Kano. I was going to work six days a week, you know, because you had to work on Saturdays. And on very unfortunate weeks, you get to work on Sundays too, you know. It's the life of a medical practitioner. I was, I was doing the same thing every day. I'll go to work, I'll scan patients, I'll come back, eat and sleep, and, you know, I'll rinse and repeat, you know, the following day. I was depressed. I was, I was asking myself, am I going to be a person who has a dream and lives his entire life? pursuing another thing. Another thing he doesn't even have talent or passion for. You know, because if you don't have talent and passion for something, especially passion, you will never be the best in that area in life, ever. You could read however, you know, I graduated as the best student in my department. I attended Bayer University, Kanu. I graduated as the best student, but I knew I wasn't the best at it. I crammed, I read. As, I mean, I'm very good at priming, at absorbing knowledge like a sponge. So I read, I passed. I was the best student. And every time, you know, people come and hail me as the best student, at, at the back of my mind, I know, I don't really know this thing, though. I crammed. I don't really know this thing at the back of my mind. So there was always that self-doubt because I didn't have passion for it. 
And I knew deep down I didn't have any talent for it. You know. So, um, I become a software engineer. And uh, one other thing I had to I had to overcome, apart from the fact that I left a paying career, and it's actually scary if you think about it. You have a career that pays you six figures at 21, at 22, at 23. And then you leave that career for a career where you don't even know how it's going to turn out. You don't know how it's going to turn out. It, it was scary at the time because I had so many offers. I was the best student, right? So I had a lot of offers. I had an offer from um, Reddington Hospital in Lagos, from Alliance, from Cedar Crest. I knew from National Hospital. So I had a lot of offers. And I could just settle and choose radiography and earn my money and work for, um, you know, 30 or 35 years, you know, and retire and die. But I chose not to. I chose to follow my passion. Even if it's not as secure as the job I had, I still decided that it was worth pursuing. And then I did that. So I've, I've, um, I've spoken to a lot of people. Of course, never in the podium. I've always avoided the podium all my life. So I've, ne I've never been on the podium my first time. But I've spoken to people. And whenever I speak to people, and then I tell them, especially young people, and I tell them to, to come into tech and work as engineers. You know, I'll facilitate it for you. I'll, I'll tell you what to do. I'll fast track you. I always get excuses. And it's always the same. You know, I sat down. I took, I took an average of all the responses I've ever got. It's always the same. I'm too old. I'm 30. I'm 35. I'm too old. I'm a woman. I'm a woman. So, I mean, so what? But I've gotten that excuse as well. I'm a woman. Whatever it means. Um, I, I, I don't have a degree. I attended uh, Federal Poly either. I don't have a degree. I attended a school of nursing. I don't have the knowledge. I've, I've never been to, you know, I don't know math. Uh, you know, so many excuses. And all of these excuses are fictitious. They are not real. They are, they are works of our mind, imaginations. And I think, I think as a species, as humans, when we don't want to do something, we create a cloud of excuses to justify our unwillingness to take action. The excuses are not there. It's a facade. It's not, it's not really there. You know, it's like the haze, you know, that we saw this morning. It's there and you can see it. But you can walk through it. Can't you? You can walk through it. It doesn't obstruct you from getting to the other part. Right? So excuses are like that. They cloud your path and they cloud your sense of judgment. And by doing so, you are telling yourself, by yourself, that you cannot. Right? No one else is telling you, and there's absolutely no facts or data or figures that says a woman cannot become a software engineer. But you still see women coming, and young girls especially, and telling you that, oh, I'm a girl. I can't be a software engineer. And I'm wondering how that ties into, how that even makes any sense. I wonder how it makes sense, because the first man that landed on the moon, the Armstrong, in 1969, the code in the program that took him to the moon was written by a woman, Margaret Hamilton, a young woman. And then I also, I, also, I also have excuses like, oh, I'm old, I'm 30, I'm 35. Where am I going to start from? <laughs> a, a certain woman, an American, by name Grace Hopper, she not only learned to code at 53, at 53, she not only learned, she invented a programming language. She invented a programming language, COBOL, C-O-B-O-L, and it's still in use today. She invented it. You know, and it's still in use today. A woman, a 53-year-old woman. So she crossed the barrier of, and that was a long time ago. It's not now, right? A long time ago when there were actually challenges if you were a woman. It was a long time ago. You weren't allowed to decide for yourself or to vote or, you know, so many things. And she crossed all these hurdles. 
and she invented the programming language. Now, I also hear of issues like, um, excuses like, oh, I'm a Nigerian. In 2020, two Nigerians sold their company for $200 million. Who are these Nigerians? They schooled in Nigeria. I think one of them schooled in Epoma. They schooled in Nigeria. They learned to code. And they founded a company, Paystack. I don't know if, you, if you've heard of Paystack. They founded Paystack. Ezra, Olivi, and, um, and Shola. They founded Paystack. And after about two or three years of, uh, of grooming it, they sold it in 2020 for $200 million. $200 million, right? So I've heard so many excuses, and I'm not here to tell you how to get into tech, because that's a, it's, it's a series on its own. It's a lecture. I can't cover it here. But I'm here to tell you, yeah, that's one of the machines I used to work with. So I, I'm here to tell you that whatever excuses you think you have to not learn to code are just like the mists or the haze that we saw today. They are not real. At whatever age, whatever gender you are, whatever school you attended, or the course, whatever course you read, you can learn how to code. And you should, too. Because I have this, I'm, I'm very opinionated. I have this opinion that everybody should learn how to code. Because why not? Why shouldn't you learn how to code? You eat food. So you should learn how to cook, right? So if you consume technology, we all consume technology. We all have apps, Facebook and Twitter and everything. And we use, we use those apps every single day. If you consume technology, why shouldn't you learn how to make technology? You should. You should give it a try. Even if you don't want a job, maybe if you, if, you're, if you are the CEO of an oil company, for instance, you don't really need a job in tech, but it's always a good, it's a good hobby. It's a good hobby to have, learn how to code. It teaches you to be creative and, and to learn how to solve issues, how to solve challenges and, uh, and problems. So if you just skip to the path, to, to the last part, I, I actually have a few quotes I wanted to, uh, to conclude with. Yeah, that's Ezra Olubi. That's the Paystack team. Yeah. Yeah, if you just pause here a bit. Um, let me tell you the story of this third man here. I know we know the first two men. The first one is Steve Wozniak, and the second man is Steve Jobs. They founded Apple, and we, we all know Apple, right? But nobody knows about the third man. That's Ronald Wayne. So these three people founded Apple in 1976. What happened was, the first two guys, you know, as they were, as they divided Apple between themselves, the first two guys took 45% of the company. 45, 45, you know, making 90. And this guy owned 10% of Apple. 10% of all Apple stock. And I'll conclude with this story, right? Now, what Ronald Wayne did was after about two or three weeks of founding Apple, he lost belief. He was 41 years old at the time. He lost belief. He didn't know that the company would become successful. So what he did was he, he traded his stocks, his 10% stock, he sold it for $800. $800. Now today, if you own a 10% stock in Apple, it will be worth anywhere around $100 to $200 billion. That's one with 11 zeros. One and 11 zeros at the back of the one. It's generational wealth. It's the kind of wealth you will have. And then you just sit down, and relax, and enjoy yourself. Right? But he lost that. Yeah, so he did the first logo of Apple and, you know, everything. He made contributions to Apple, but he was not persistent. He didn't have belief. He lost faith. And, you know, he now works in a casino in a small town in the U.S. So two main points I'll conclude with is, if you have decided to change your life, if you've decided to, you know, to take on the adventure of becoming an engineer, you first need to take action. You should take action. Action is the precursor to success. You need to take action first before you become successful. That's number one. The second thing and the second lesson which you take from that story is consistency. Because action is not enough. The first action is required, but it's not enough. It's not sufficient. You need to be consistent. You need to stay true and stubborn. 
And you need to be able to see the way forward, even when others can't and don't want to. Thank you.